<clears throat> Thanks for having me. So this image encapsulates a crisis, and you can only imagine how bad this is. This is uh, taken one day after the Christchurch earthquake in February. And you can see that for all these houses here, no power, no water, no sewage, uh, no phone lines, mobile networks down. How do they get their information? They may go to their friend's place and turn on the television, and they can get bombed with images of the same buildings falling down over and over and again, and people crying and all the rest of it. And I'm sure a lot of you were bombed with those same images immediately after the earthquake. And what I want to get across are a few key messages here. And one of them is that this is a very critical time for scientists. This is science communication in a crisis. When we have what I would refer to as, as an open door, uh, a window to make a major impact on the way people think uh, around New Zealand. And so how we communicate as scientists during a crisis, what we would call the response uh, phase of a natural disaster, strongly influences the public perception of all science in the aftermath. If the science that we communicate, if we take that opportunity, we communicate that well, then the general public can actually appreciate all forms of science. Better to take it more seriously, to better integrate it into their lives. Um, effective science communication when the window opens is essential if we want to reduce our casualties and increase our financial resilience to future, nat future natural disasters. If we communicate well, then people will be less uh, likely to want to live in earthquake vulnerable buildings. They will take land, potential land up against unstable cliffs and close to vulnerable areas and that little thing that says liquefaction susceptible on their limbs, they will take that more seriously and we will be able to decrease our vulnerability as a nation. So I think as a science communicator what I want to focus on is largely my experience in this space but this gives you some idea about how I view the importance of communicating in a crisis. And not only in, during a crisis, but in the aftermath of a crisis, crisis where we go through phases of recovery and then reducing our future vulnerability and then preparing ourselves as a nation for the next natural disaster as it occurs. So, uh, you know, the September earthquake was quite a spectacular thing for me. We had no casualties. A few unreinforced masonry buildings fell down. But it was a geologist's dream, and it created this uh, beautiful surface rupture across the Canterbury Plains that we could go and study. And I want to talk about what I did personally in those few, first few hours, first few days, that allowed me to, what I say, inject science into the national international media bomb that went on basically in the wee hours of the morning of September 4th, of 2010. It started with me actually listening to the radio at uh, 5.30 in the morning or something like that. We had no power, water, sewage, etc. at my house, but we did have uh, a car that was working and we had a radio inside. We were listening to the radio and the, uh, there was talk about all this stuff that had happened, this horrible thing that had happened, but there was no science in that report. It was just a discussion of people calling in saying there's sand in my yard, for instance. So my partner said, you should call in and you should explain what's going on. And I did. And from that one phone call, uh, within an hour and a half, I was sitting in some stranger's living room being interviewed on the nightly news in the US to some 8 million, view 8 million viewers uh, with my partner there, Candace. Uh, from that, I went over to the TV and Z studios in Christchurch and, and gave an interview there that was about seven or eight minutes long on national television. And uh, you know that from there, of course, we just window, we opened that window up. There was a scientist there who was able to talk about science in, in just sort of a natural way, and uh, that that provided that opportunity to put science in the in the in the um, big picture as opposed to just uh, damaged buildings and so on. The questions that I was asked in that first bit, in that first few few minutes and first few hours of the event, a lot about my personal experience. What was it like? Was this a geologist's dream? I put geologist in bracket there because this could pertain to any of you. Is it a biologist's dream to have this sort of thing happen? Um, the science, when we got to the science, it was all around basic observations, my basic observations as a scientist. They weren't interested in the equations that, that, in, that uh, relate to liquefaction thresholds uh, and peak ground accelerations. They were interested in what happened. The ground started shaking, etc. Uh, how much damage was there? What, where was the liquefaction? That sort of stuff. 
Um, was this expected? Was it complete surprise, or did we know about this, this, this fall? How does this compare to historical events? Is this unprecedented in New Zealand, or did this happen 200 years ago, for instance? Um, basic overviews of the context, of where, we, where we fit in New Zealand. So again, this pertains to all of you as scientists, the basic nuts and bolts of what you do as scientists, talking about how New Zealand sits on the plate boundary, etc. Um, what's next? How long will the aftershocks go on for? How big? Again, we're already talking about this now, only hours after that first event. But these are things that people, the general public, are concerned about. To me, it highlights these two things. It's important of having a well-stocked well -stocked and rapidly deployable knowledge base. So not just being focused in your narrow little thing that you do day in, day out, but having a general knowledge of your field that you can snap to and talk to the general public about at any time. And the importance of having national and international connections. At this time, I didn't have a smartphone. I wasn't modern enough yet. I just had one of those little Nokia things that ran out of power every few hours. Um, but I was able to talk to colleagues at the USGS, the Geological Survey, over in the US, and having a well-connected uh, group of colleagues in New Zealand so that I could actually communicate via them. They were sitting on their computers. They could give me information that I wasn't able to obtain. Within days of the event, uh, the mood changed a little bit, but there were impromptu discussions with key decision makers like this. It's important, important not to freak out when someone that's uh, this important is standing beside you asking you to explain your basic observations, something that most of us as scientists should be pretty good at doing. If we can explain it to our mates, then we can probably explain it to this guy or this guy on, te on television. So there was a lot of this sort of stuff. The current affair programs moved in. I was still doing TV. Uh, radio and newspaper interviews and started to give lectures to the most se severely impacted communities. So for instance, the rural sector in this instance. This is all after um, the September earthquake. More stuff about my personal experience. What did it feel like? How are you coping? Do you still love this stuff? Has your enthusiasm dwindled? Have your services been restored? It was interesting how much of the stuff became personal. As, as scientists, a lot of us are reluctant to, to talk about our personal lives, but of course that's a really important thing. We are human after all, aren't we? We don't just sit around and crunch numbers all the time. We have lives. It's important to get that out to the public. More detail on the impact. How much, how big. More details on the process. Getting in a little bit deeper, but still quite shallow in terms of the knowledge base. Again, what's next? What's going to happen in the next few weeks? What's going to happen in the next few months? How long can this possibly go on for? How big could these aftershocks get? Why did we get off so lightly? Of course, in September, we did get off very lightly. Uh, it was important for me, being on the research front line, going out and doing the work, having colleagues that I could talk to on a day in and day out, so I could answer these things updated from, the, from basically the science I had learned an hour or two before. Again, having good connections and a lot of patience, because really, as much as we like to think that media types are incredibly creative, the same few questions get recast in very similar sorts of ways time and time and time again. And I could probably pin it down to about five questions I got asked about 50 times in those first few days to even weeks. So I maintained my, my own public website throughout this. And this was something, this is kind of a, something I want to communicate to everyone here. This is my old website that was actually at one stage just important enough to get hacked, so it doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> but what this allowed me to do as an independent um, intellectual was to just give unfiltered hypotheses, my ideas, my observations. I didn't go through a press office. I didn't ask my boss. It wasn't affiliated with the university. I just put down my, my ideas, my thoughts on my website. The public could go to it. And you can see that the actual the public did go to it. For an academic website, largely about geology with like peer-reviewed science papers, 10,000 uh, visits in a day is quite a lot for me. <laughs> uh, and you can see that actually it relates a lot to, um, to the number of earthquakes we were getting, of course. So as the earthquakes began to reduce in frequency, fewer people stopped coming to the site, which was OK. I'm all right with that. But one thing to, to look at is that this sustained at a much higher level over time. So once word got out that this was a place to go to get basically the common man's science unfiltered, then the, the, the number of unique visitors I got to my site 
post-earthquake, 30,000 roughly in September, stayed high. That several thousands per, per month. So I think this is a very important thing for us all to, con to consider as intellectuals. Should we have our own websites? Should we use that to get our messages out? Peter's going to talk about this a little bit in a little bit more detail, but this just highlights what I'm saying. Where do people our age, I'll use that term loosely, um, where do young, young people get their, get their news from? This is, this is uh, 18 to 29 year olds. This is based in the US, but this, I think this is, if not the future, or sorry, if not the present, then the future in New Zealand. Most people get their news from the internet in that age group in the US. And actually, if we look at old people, that, that um, where people get their news is, is actually increasing in terms of the internet relative to other news sources. So we can control the message here. We have our own websites and so on, we can do that. Um, but of course, radio was the most important for those in the worst hit areas during a crisis. So you had to communicate across all, all bases at that time. Within months of the events, I was giving lectures to all audiences. I was talking to Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Association, Christchurch City Council, university students, primary schools, the general public, and so on, local newspapers, popular science magazines. Everybody wanted the story, and it was basically the same sort of story that they wanted, but they all wanted the story. Out filming geology and documentaries, writing up peer-reviewed literature. It was quite a busy time. You know, it's pretty rare when, again, as a scientist, you can get a story on the front page of the newspaper. Very, very rare. But there was a tremendous thirst, thirst for information there. Um, and so, yeah, I think my, my point is here is that, again, people were interested in that personal experience. How are you coping? What happened? They still wanted to know the basics of what happened. What's next? Same questions. Effects on other known quantities. And again, I put things in brackets here because I want you to be able to apply this to your own knowledge base. To think about how if uh, I replace that with, with some other known quantity. The interactions amongst things. People were very interested in that. What are scientists working on? What new discoveries have you come up with? And so on. Um, I wanted to highlight one of the articles I, uh, one of the articles written about one of the lectures I, give, I gave in, in October. Uh, this was just uh, a month and a half after that September earthquake. And it's about getting that message right. We need to, I mean, if L'Aquila tells us anything, the recent earthquake trial, the, the earthquake scientists on trial and convicted actually over there, uh, it tells us that we need to mention and we need to be um, responsible for bringing forth the potential of very low probability but very high consequence scenarios in our science. So when I talk about things like uh, the unpredictability of the locations specifically, I want to balance that by saying, but here's all the good things we can do. So instead of just highlighting all the stuff that scientists don't know, also highlight the things that we do know. I'm talking about why we do and don't know them. There's a quite a good chance we've had our biggest aftershock. Uh, sure, I'd love to have that statement back because it wasn't the case. At the time, we had a 5.9. But I also said that based on other situations around the globe, which were informing my decisions for the public, this is what I think. And the public can handle us being wrong if we give them an explanation for why we think what we think. So that was why, that was why um, things came through OK in that situation. Influences on the Alpine Fault, all the other sorts of things. I often use this, the, the scientist we, of course, because I'm not doing all this work. How could anyone do all this work? But by saying we all the time, we as scientists, I was able to represent that broader group. And not too many of them took exception to that, I don't think. But this is really important, what we know and why we know it, what we think and why we think it, and what we don't know and why we don't know. And so people coming to my lectures would say, I just wanted to understand it more, to find out what happened and why it happened. You know, they haven't found a fault line for 16,000 years. That's stuck in everyone's brain, of course, and may or may not be true. So it was good, lots of answers. That's what, stress, that's what the stressed public wanted to know. They just wanted to have some information, some good science information in this space. Uh, and then February happened in June and December, and the focus shifted. And now, of course, when we look at these numbers, if you're not a Christchurch resident or you haven't been down there and felt some of these earthquakes, it's kind of hard to explain. But what this is, is many hundreds of heart in your throat moments when the ground starts shaking and you don't know what's going to happen over two years and more. So where do we go from here? 
things that I've publicly commented on February 22nd. Because you know what? Scientists actually should be commenting publicly. And they should be commenting on things as intellectuals outside of their, their immediate narrow field of expertise, mm -hmm. if it is narrow. Because someone has to, right? So why not people that actually think about it, things in a systematic, scientific sort of way? This is just a list here. I don't need to go through the whole things. But you can just get some idea about the breadth of things I've been asked to comment on and have chosen to. Various aspects of the earthquake sequence, earthquake predictions, properties of seismic waves, earthquake triggering, liquefaction, rockfall, those sort of stuff. The geological history of Christchurch in New Zealand. Land use planning. Should we have built in these areas or not? Why or why not? How do we make our cities more resilient? These are things that I have chosen to take on because I feel that independent scientists have the responsibility to share their intellectual property and that we need to maintain our communication through the four R's, through that whole sequence of natural disaster. What did I learn from all this? To stay relevant, you have to be multidisciplinary and you have to be up to date. If you stay relevant, you can stay in the news and you can be more influential. If you have a broad knowledge base, you're able to discuss lots of these things. If you can go on to Google Scholar and process things within a couple minutes, then you can stay relevant. You can stay modern, right? And most of us should actually be pretty good at doing that. That's where it comes down to adequately preparing for an interview. You don't want to get up and say something because the public will go to Google Scholar and they will find the most updated article and they will tell you if they think you're wrong. So, um, yeah. So here's some of the things I do now. And this is my final slide. I write my own press releases and I just send them to key contacts. I don't go through my media office. Perhaps I should, but I don't. Um, I write opinion pieces for the Press and the Herald. I write pieces for the New Zealand Science Media Centre. Thanks, Peter. And The Conversation, which is an Australian-based uh, uh, similar vein, internet news. I write for popular science magazines, do television, do documentaries, etc., etc. And I also share, share my peer-reviewed science with the public via my website, which is in the background there, my new one. Because I kind of feel like if we're doing research with public funding, then they should have the ability to actually access our information without having to pay 50 bucks. Okay. Thank you.